is one of the hardest tasks in the world. In 1991, Ian Woosnam did it. With this putt, he won the U.S. Masters. For four days, he played almost faultless golf. Drives that scorched down the fairways, inch-perfect putts on the green, time after time under excruciating pressure. He reached number one in the world rankings. For a year, he was the best golfer in the world. But a player's form can come and go. In 1991, he won six tournaments. In 1995, none. He needs to find out what happened to his famous swing and how to get it back. With his winning streak came fame and fortune. Ian Woosnam lives comfortably in Jersey, but he's still a man of the people, a man from a Welsh farming background who made good through hard work and perseverance. This is a pro celebrity event at the new Celtic Manor course in his native Wales, attended by other high flyers of the sporting world. Even with his lack of winning form, Ian Woosnam plays golf at its very best. Watch him in the company of amateur players, and the difference is obvious. It's all in the swing of the club. Amateurs do not have the same elegance or economy of effort. They certainly cannot match the power of the famous Woosnam Drive. This massive tee shot at the final hole in the U.S. Masters won him the title. He was tied with Watson and Eliza Ball. They both had trouble with the bunkers approaching the green, but Woosnam had a different strategy, to soar over the bunkers. It's amazing, you know, I look back now, my caddy tells me it was 286 yards of carry where I carried it. I knew there was acres and acres of spaces down the left with no trouble at all, and I thought the, the safest play was to hit it over there, take all the trouble out. His drive cleared the bunkers, giving him a simple shot back towards the green. Master strokes like these were once hallmarks of Woosnan's game. To get back to his old form, he must first find out what it was he used to do so well. He's focusing particularly on his swing. Seve Ballesteros used to call it the sweetest swing in Europe. Woosnam has known top coach Keith Williams almost all of his life. Williams is the professional here at the new Celtic Manor course in Wales. What is it about a golf swing that makes people call it sweet? A sweet swing, I always feel, is a, a very complimentary description of somebody who has the most wonderful coordination in their movements as a golfer. It allows him to create a tremendous amount of uh, speed of the club head through impact and to hit the ball hard with control. And, and that is really very important to be able to hit the ball with extreme speed and control. The Woosnam swing is almost mechanically precise. It's all in the way he keeps his head still while his body turns. Somewhere in this complex sequence of movements lies the key to the power of the shot. Ian Woosnam thinks that the action of his arms and wrist is important. We get like a whiplash, and at the very point of where the ball is, that's the end of the whiplash. It's like, you know, everybody's done it with a towel. When you were a kid, you know, you whiplash somewhere, and if you just get it just right at the end, it really catches and it really hurts, you know what I mean? It's getting that whiplash right at the end. That's what you're looking for. OK, let's try another shot, shall we? Any aspiring golfer would love to get the same power as Woosnam, but trying to flick a golf club like a wet towel won't lead to instant success. Teaching the golf swing is difficult because it's over in just a fifth of a second. But modern science is stepping in to help coaches and athletes. It's now possible to slow the swing down to one hundredth of its normal speed. Put another line there, right? From his research, Professor Ronald Mill now knows the secret of the Woosnam power drive. It's not in the strength of his arms. I did a plane through there. 
A golfer works at something like four horsepower to hit the ball 250, 260 yards. Now, the muscles in the body that can supply that sort of power are not in the hands and the forearms. They're in the legs and the back. The golf swing is made up of two movements, which combine to accelerate the head of the club. The first is the arms, rotating around the center of the body. The second is the club, rotating around the wrist. The skill that top golfers like Woosnam have perfected is called the late hit. It delays the second club rotation until the speed of the shoulder turn has reached its peak. It's all a matter of timing to let the momentum of the shoulder turn shoot the club out. It's a free hinge action, just allowing the momentum of the swing to flow out to the club head from all the large muscle work that's gone in. So that's the last third of the downswing, this fast uncocking of the, yes. of the wrists is just the momentum of what's been yeah. built up prior to prior that to, point. Prior to that point. And, and the late hit is the trick of keeping that momentum stored, as it were, as late as possible, and then allowing it all to hang out mm -hmm. and uh, just letting it, it go. Slow motion images reveal dramatically how all Woosnam's strength is put into turning his shoulders. It's the equivalent of a sprinter leaving the starting blocks. The club head speed starts low, but increases quickly to reach a peak of 110 miles an hour as it strikes the ball. For a millisecond, the ball is deformed. Then it springs away at 160 miles an hour. On impact, the club head is suddenly slowed and a shock wave travels up the shaft of the club. This is what the golfer feels in his hands and might think is the moment of impact. It's not. The ball is already several feet away. As the club swings around, it pulls outwards with a force of 150 times its own weight. To counterbalance this, the golfer needs to shift his weight from his right to his left foot. Woosnam saw how he had this weight shift perfected when he was swinging at his best. It's incredible, you know, it's my left foot is off the ground, so all my weight is on my right foot on the backswing. So then all my weight can actually slide onto my left foot and get all the weight on my left foot coming through the ball. But these new images also show something else. For the first time, Woosnam realized that he was coiling too far in his backswing. His weight was in the wrong place. There's too much weight on my left side at the top of the backswing. I'm very steep on it. I'm very narrow, especially if you see it with my shirt off. It looks like my right shoulder is very cramped. And as I come down, my right shoulder is going over the top, coming down very steep. With the new evidence of the slow motion camera, Ian Woosnam found the reason for his slump. By trying to improve his swing, he'd actually made it worse. The change was subtle, but affected the power and accuracy of his shots. But why had he changed it at all? Shouldn't he have left well enough alone? Could say that. <laughs> it's true, that, that's definitely true. You know, I should never have tried to change it. You know, when you've got one of the best swings in the world, you try to improve and I should never have done it. And now it's very difficult to get back to where I was. Woosnam needs to regain more than his driving power. He needs control of his shots. The mark of a top golfer is the ability to bend the ball in the air. He can draw it to the left or fade it to the right to follow the shape of the fairway or get around an obstacle to the green. This skill has always been something of a Woosnam specialty. When in control, is like, you know, you, you know you're in control of your golf swing, which controls the ball. And, you know, then when you can do that, it doesn't matter where the flag is on the green, what hole you're playing. If the flag's at the right-hand side, you can fade the ball into the hole. The flag's at the, on the left-hand side, then you can draw the ball into the green. You know, you, first of all, you've got to have control of one shot, and the control for me is the draw. Slow motion reveals how Woosnan gets his shots to bend in midair. The secret is putting just the right amount of sideways spin on the ball. 
play a normal shot that doesn't bend, he brings the club face through square to the target. You can see how the loft of the club sets up some backspin, but there is no sideways spin. To play a draw shot, bending the ball to the left, he first changes his stance to turn the swing path to the right. Then he turns the face of the club to keep it square to the ball. In slow motion, you can see how the club is moving across the back of the ball as it makes contact. This glancing blow produces side spin. Ball in the air demonstrates how its curved flight is produced. As the ball spins, it drags a thin layer of passing air around with it. This revolving air will be pushing against the slipstream on the right-hand side, and this forces the ball to the left, around a tree that was blocking a straight shot to the green. As the ball slows in its flight, the bend becomes more pronounced. The shot should drop neatly onto the green to give a simple putt to the hole. Being able to produce creative shots like these is the way to win tournaments. You also need the courage to play them under pressure. There's a great example, I think, on the 13th hole at Augusta. I'm behind this tree. I know I can reach the green, but there's, there's water all around it. Do I take the risk? You know, I know I can make an easy five by knocking it down the front, chipping on the green two putts. Or do I take the risk of going for it? What I did is I went for the green, on the green, nearly all the putt. I make an easy birdie. You know, but I could have knocked it in the water and taken six quite easily. The next day, Woosman's tee shot landed in the water. Even the best players sometimes get into trouble. The mark of a champion is to get out of it without dropping a crucial shot. Often, this requires a certain inventiveness. Adventurous play always carries risk. Of all golf strokes, it's the daring recovery shot that thrills spectators. Getting out of difficult places is part of the art. In the early days, I used to get myself in some right trouble, and uh, if you do, if you're there enough of times, you actually see these gaps. Oh, that's a four iron. I'll, I'll go underneath that gap and chase it onto the green. You actually see these shots. Seve's another brilliant guy, I think, because he, he hits it wild as well. And he has this natural ability to get it out. You know, that's what people want to watch as well. Not, they don't want to watch you just going down the fairway all the time. You know, that's great golf, yeah, but they want to see him go in trouble and they want to see him get out and make a birdie. You know what I mean? is a master of the recovery shot. He has supreme skill in shaping the flight of the ball, whatever the lie, whatever the slope, getting the club face to make the right contact with the ball. These are not just trick shots for the gallery. They are essential elements of the world-class game. Players like Ian Wisdom have changed the sphere of the game because the generation of players now are so powerful, hit the ball so far that golf course design has changed and courses have become uh, longer to test the golfers out. They've become far more challenging. Greens are smaller, bunkers are deeper, water plays a greater part. Modern, more difficult course designs are reflected in this tricky hole at the new Celtic Manor course. It's the 13th. A downhill drive lands on a fairway that slopes steeply away into the rough. Even if your ball stops on the fairway, the green is set into a hill on the other side of a deep ravine. It's guarded by some of the deepest bunkers on the course. The sand is almost 10 feet below the level of the green. Landing in one of these would be unnerving. You would not even see the top of the flag. club golfer. They have terror of the bunker. They want to sort of dig a big hole in the ground when they get in there and just 
gouge the ball out and hope that they get the ball out somewhere on the green. But to a professional like Keith Williams, getting a ball out of a deep bunker like this is feasible. The textbook shot is to drive the sand iron into the bunker behind the ball to scoop it out on a cushion of sand. In slow motion, the result is spectacular. The sand is transformed. It becomes almost like a liquid swirling around the ball and lifting it out. Where good players like Keith Williams can get onto the green, Ian Woosnam can go one better, floating the ball right up to the flag and stopping it dead. I can get better contact than what he can. He's hitting too far behind it. He's thinking of getting it out, I'm thinking of spinning it. That's the difference. Slow motion images reveal the secret. Woosnam takes less sand than the textbook approach. This produces the extra backspin while still lifting the ball high in the air to clear the bunker. But the shot carries risk. It's easy to misjudge and send the ball skidding wildly past the green. What Ian Woosnan does is bring the club down in a chopping motion, cutting across the line of play. This lets him just clip the bottom of the ball. It produces phenomenal backspin, over 6,000 revolutions a minute. He can even float the ball past the pin and have the spin roll it back. However skillful you are at getting onto the green, you still have to sink the putt. This is the moment where it all pays off. The rewards can be tantalizingly close, just one delicate stroke to win or lose the match. I've dreamed this moment, you know what I mean? And you know, you spend all your life as a kid wanting to be in that situation. All of a sudden, you're there, and you think, this is my big opportunity, and uh, that's what you practice for all them hours and hours on the putting green and all the hours on the practice ground. Here you are standing on the 18th green with an eight-foot putt to win the Masters, and. Uh, it went in. You know, it's like dreaming, really. Lately, Woosnam's dream has turned into a nightmare. His putting has been letting him down, and it's absolutely crucial to the game. Putting needs to be technically correct. In fact, we, we need to be even more correct if one looks at it, really, at this half the game. For, for a player of Ian Woosnam's standard, you know, he, he's nearly producing 50% of his shots on the green. It should be the easiest part of the game, really, because you're only use, moving the putter just over a foot backwards, you know what I mean? So it should be easy. But it's not easy. The green is not flat. It's made to slope in different directions to throw the ball off course. A golfer's skill at putting depends on his ability to read the green. Very top players have better eyesight than the rest of us, they can make out subtle shading that indicates where the contours are. Then they mentally plot how the ball will run. Now I'm looking for something to give me a bit of help, really, to find a spot. You know, you're looking at the hole and there's a four-foot swing. You can sort of like pick something four foot right of the hole, and you're looking for anything, really. I want that ball to go over that mark, which then from there it's gonna run into the hole. But there is another factor in the equation, the grass itself. It has a nap or grain. This is caused by the way it's cut. Some say the blades of grass also align themselves with the sun or head towards a source of water. It all adds uncertainty to the calculations a golfer has to make. So if you've got a putt which is going into the grain, into the nap, it's going to be much slower. But if you're putting down the nap, it's going to be a lot faster. And obviously, if you're putting across it, the ball's going to swing more. How would you do it? It is from feel, because 
you know, is, is the nap going to move an inch? Plus, there's going to be two inches of swing as well. So, you know, it's only feel and eye, eye and hand coordination, really. And, you know, it's, it's, it drives you nuts sometimes. <laughs> On the green, the slightest lack of confidence can take its toll. You can line the shot up to perfection in the mind, but if doubt sets in, the execution of the move will fail. But Woosnan is an old hand at the game. He has ways of coping with the pressure. You know, you've got to have the self-belief that I've, you know, I've been underneath this pressure before, I've done it before, you know, and stand there and think of what what you do on the putting green, you know, get my stance right. A routine is very important. What do I do? You know, I line it up and then I get my feet comfortable and I have a couple more looks, take it back smooth, keep your head still and hit it. And once you've hit it, you can't do nothing else about it, you know, it's gone, you know. The typical thing is that, you know, I do it myself most of the time because I've not been putting well. You get anxious and I've actually looked at the hole before I've actually struck the ball, you know, so you've got no chance of... You know, you, you've got to keep your head still. Ian Woosnan's loss of confidence on the green has put enormous pressure on his greatest strength, his swing. He believes that rediscovering his old swing is the way to restore his game. And seeing what is wrong with his action in the slow motion has given him new hope. It doesn't matter what any coach can tell me. You've got to picture it yourself, and I can picture it now. I know what I'm doing, it's, but it's, it's actually, you know, to do the right thing feels very uncomfortable. When I think I'm uncomfortable, I must probably swing in the right way. On a beach in Jersey, Ian Woosnam practices his swing. In his career, he has won almost 40 tournaments, including one of the majors, the U.S. Masters. Could he see himself winning one of the major tournaments again? The way I'm swinging, no. I have to get back to where I was swinging. If I can get back to where I was swinging, there's no doubt about it, I can win another one. A few more, if I can get like I used to swing. Rediscovering his old swing may restore the driving ambition that once took him to the top. He may once again become the best golfer in the world. I think anybody who wants to be good at any, any sport, doesn't matter what you want to be, you've got to put your goals at the highest level. And uh, I just had this feeling that, you know, I wanted to be the best in the world. I wanted to be a millionaire. I wanted, you know, all the great luxuries, like everybody else did, uh, uh, top uh, sports people. And uh, that's what's happened to me, you know. If you need something badly enough, you've got to have that objective to go 